Okay, so what we're doing tonight is question and answer. Whoa. We're doing question and answer, so um, I am by myself, so have grace on me as we do this. But um, if you would, um, if you have questions, you can write them down on a piece of paper. You can text them to, oh, MJ, we put up the line of that slide. Should have the number on it, the question and answer slide. Q and A, there we go. 208-991-2756. I have my phone here so I can get the text message if you send a message. Let's see if I have any. Not yet. Um, so you can text a question. Uh, Matt's going to be around with the basket, to, or not a basket, I guess, just uh, pick them up. And if you, you can just raise your hand if you have a question, too, and I will do those as soon as we get through the written ones. So text, write down, hand them to Matt. Thank you, sir. And, um, and you can, um, oh, and the Facebook people. I forgot about the Facebook people. Let me see. I will bring up that as well. Actually, yeah. I'll just bring it up. Facebook. Okay. Stop. Ah, there it is. Okay. Doesn't look like we have any questions on Facebook yet. So if you're on Facebook, watching on Facebook, you can um, just type in a question and I will see if I can get to that as well. All right. So um, the first question I got was handed to me earlier, and it wasn't too bad, Mariah. I, it's like a book, so I thought I was going to really have to struggle with this. So um, Mariah um, wrote, oh, sorry, I guess I didn't have to say it was you. Too late now. Um, so the question is, in Exodus chapter 7, verse 3, God says he will harden Pharaoh's heart um, to multiply his sorrow. How'd that get turned back up? And um, so the question is, did God actually harden his heart, or was it because of the events that took place that it hardened it? So was it like God physically doing it, or the events? It's interesting because um, if you look at the, what the Bible says, Exodus chapter 9, um, it goes through Exodus chapter 9, verse 34, um, and actually it starts out in Exodus 8, um, 15, and then Exodus 8, 32, and then Exodus 9, 34, it, it talks about Pharaoh hardening his own heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then it says that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so really was a process of, of Pharaoh again and again and again as God put the plagues onto Egypt as punishment um, for their hard bondage uh, on the Israelites. Pharaoh continued to harden his own heart. And, and a lot of that had to do with unbelief <coughs> because... You know, Janus and Jambres, the magicians of Pharaoh, were performing signs and wonders. And they were duplicating the, the things that Moses was doing, the things that God was doing that, through Moses. And so um, he, he just chose to believe that God's not real, God's not serious. Um, and, and what God was doing as he was allowing Pharaoh to continue to harden his heart was he was judging all of the all of the gods of, of Egypt because they worshipped the Nile and he turned it to blood. They worshipped the flies. He you know overwhelmed them with flies. They worshipped the frogs. They worship all these things that they worshipped. Um, they worshipped the cows and the cows got boils and died or blight and died. And so because they worshipped all these things, God brought judge. He judged them according to their gods. And so those things came upon them. You know. And so um, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Now some people will take. Um, Romans chapter 9, where it talks about Pharaoh, you know, God hardens who he will and God, you know, doesn't, you know, blesses whom he will. And they use that as a, a proof text for what they would call um, monergism or m probably more likely what you'd understand it as Calvinism versus Arminianism. And the idea that God um, 
sends some people to hell because he wants to and sends other people to heaven because he wants to and that there is no choice. God's sovereign and he chooses who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell and we have no say in it. Um, and that kind of goes into your next question. It says, um, talks about uh, also what is free will. We're told that we have free will, but it is, is it to do whatever we want or free will to choose God? Because if God intervenes in a non-believer's life, is that taking away his free will? Also, is it free will? Um, is free will stated in the Bible, or is it just assumed? Okay, good question. So that kind of brings it into the next section of this question. So, does a believer truly have free will? Um, let's look at John chapter one. John chapter one is where we'll start. John chapter 1 is speaking about Jesus coming into the world. And and it talks, you know, of course, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. (coughs) And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, then it talks about John the Baptist, but then in verse 9, it's speaking of the light again. It says, that was the true light, speaking of Jesus, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But, notice this, verse 12, As many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. And of course, we all know John 3.16. John 3.16 states, um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, okay, and and we read about that, has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So, what we learn from these two passages, John chapter 1, is that Jesus is a light that shines into every single man who comes into the world. And that light, of course, we learn as we go through, as Jesus talks about, he's going to send the Holy Spirit that's going to testify of him. The light of Jesus is that Holy Spirit coming in and shining Jesus' light into your life. Every single person born gets that light shined into their, into their life. They have a choice at that point whether to receive it. As it says here, as many as would receive him, they could become the children of God. Or to reject it, they would not come to the light because their deeds were evil and they didn't want their deeds exposed. Now, all of us, our deeds are evil. We're born in sin, we're born with that sin nature, and so all of us have the propensity to, to sin and do the wrong thing, and so then Jesus shines his light into our lives, and that's the Holy Spirit coming and saying, you are a sinner, you're going to go to hell for the things you're doing, you need to turn and turn to God. <coughs> and at that point, we have a choice. Am I going to choose God, or am I going to choose my life? We have a choice to repent. And repenting means to turn. To turn from my worthless wrecked life to God's abundant life. Or to reject God's abundant life and follow my own path. Because my deeds are evil and I don't want to be exposed. And God is the great exposer, isn't he? And so we have that that choice. Now, having said that, it's paradoxical. Because we know that, well, let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, in Romans chapter 8, it says, um, verse 20, 28. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, and to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined 
to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so it has this progression of God foreknowing and then predestining. So um, the, the, the problem that we have is that it tells, the Bible tells that we are predestined from the foundation of the world. So when God created the world, all that we're going to go to heaven, we're going to go to heaven, and all that we're not going to go to heaven, we're not going to go to heaven. And so how do we reconcile that? Well, we reconcile that by knowing God's attributes. And God's attribute is that he is eternal. That's one of his attributes. God, when he created everything in the beginning, on the first second, he saw the end instantly. And he can't unsee it. You know, you ever been in one of those situations where you see something, you can't unsee it? It's like, you know... Never mind, we don't even talk about that. But, you know, you see something, you're like, oh, I wish that, you know, I can't unsee, I can't unsee that. So, here's, here's God who sees the beginning to the end, and he knows those who are his, but in fairness, God also knows that we are going, our lives are going to unroll through time. God's outside of time, he sees the beginning from the end, but he also knows that our lives are in time, and that he is absolutely fair and just in that he allows his wooing presence to be in every single person. And so from our perspective, there is still future and that's still undecided. You know, am I going to choose God or am I going to choose my flesh? And so for us, there's absolute free will within the constrict of time, but God knows the end already. He sees us seated with Christ in heavenly places. So those who are saved are saved. And, and those who are not saved are not going to be saved. But that doesn't mean that everybody didn't have a choice in that matter. You know? And so we, going through time, choose or we don't choose. And it's not for us to know the end until we get there, right? And when we're standing face to face with Jesus. So, again, um, you have this argument between monergism and synergism or Calvinism and Arminianism is what we would probably know them as, but the real names of them are monergism, meaning God did everything alone. He chose everything. And on the other hand, man has complete free will and does everything. And, and synergism goes from, you know, man, it's all up to man to do all the work, which most Christians don't believe, um, all the way to monergism, which is God does all the work. But synergism leaves it at God does all the work and it, it's a degree of God and man working together, you know, and, and to what degree people believe, you know, is to what degree you are an Arminian versus a Calvinist or a monergist versus a, a synergist. So um, what most Christians would believe, I think, is that God woos us, we respond to that wooing by allowing him to save us, or well, I guess we shouldn't say it that way, but allowing that light to do its saving work in our lives. He's been shining into our life. God's always first. He shines his light. We respond to that light. And if we receive it, then we become children of God. If we reject it, then we don't become children of God. And that's, and that's the difference between somebody who's born again and somebody who's not born again. Does that make sense? I know this is probably confusing. But um, anyway, everybody has blank stares, so... How are you guys on Facebook doing? Okay, <clears throat> so the way the way I see it, and this is this is my perspective on the whole thing, and and um, when we look at when we look at um, Romans chapter eight, he starts it out with whom God foreknew. He knew because he he's has complete foreknowledge. He knows the future. He's been in the future. He's been in the past. God can move back and forth within time. So. Whom he foreknew, he predestined. So God saw that you would choose him, so he chose you. But he chose you before you were born, so he chose you first. Does that make sense? <laughs> Shouldn't make complete sense because it's God, right? He's outside of time. Um, but Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 are dealing with a specific subject. And this is what, and so a lot of times a Calvinist will take you to. Romans chapter 9, to try to prove Calvinism. Whom God hardens, he hardens, and whom he doesn't harden, or whom he um, blesses, he, he will. <coughs> we will. But what you have to understand is, Paul is writing in that section to the Israelites who were in 
in um, Rome who were rightfully so, and, and every Israelite, who rightfully so, saying, how come I can live my entire life obeying God and following God and being um, observing the law and doing everything I'm supposed to do, and you say I'm going to hell, and this Gentile who just went to a prostitute last night, and he's been smoking stuff, and he's been drinking stuff, and he's been a, a, a vagabond and a, a horrible person, and he comes and accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he's going to heaven. How is that fair? And so, basically, what he's doing is he's working on the whole question of fairness. It's God's prerogative to allow a Gentile who hasn't followed God his entire life to be saved by believing in Jesus. And he allows a Jew who's worked very hard his entire life to be an upright and upstanding Jew who gets saved to be a Christian if he believes in Jesus. But if he doesn't, then he doesn't get to. And that's the, that's the great injustice. It's the same parable that Jesus told when he says the guy went out at the first hour of the day and he picked up some people to work. They worked all day long. And then he went out the 11th hour and he picked up some guys and they worked an hour and then he paid everybody the same. You know, and, and the people who were there longer were complaining, how come they didn't have to work all day? And so that's the same type of thing. We're, we're saved by grace, not because of works. And we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ um, through his grace. It's a gift of God. It's not of works lest any man should boast. And so our salvation doesn't have to do with the work that we do, but the work that Jesus did. Now, if someone's truly saved, that should produce following works, not works that save them, but works that they do because Jesus has called them to, to live for him. And that is produced by the Holy Spirit in our life. And so that should be the fruit, some of the fruit or the outcome of the Christian life. So anyway, um, j- just to, to back up just a little bit, I want to talk briefly about the fall and how my perspective on this whole argument, because I think that this whole argument just gets into areas that we don't necessarily understand because we're not outside of time. Um, Synergism is from man's perspective or Arminianism. It's kind of every day I choose how I'm going to live. Um, And monergism or Calvinism is kind of from God's perspective. The Calvinist sees God's sovereignty as something that they want to protect. And the synergist sees, understands that what the Calvinist does to God is makes him into a monster. <laughs> and, and yet the, what the Calvinist sees is that what, what the Arminian does or the synergist does is make God into weak. But I think that it's neither. I think that, that man has given free choice. God is completely sovereign and he made it so that man could have free choice. That's his whole purpose in the creation, not so that he could just choose arbitrarily. And this is why. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. Well, let's back to verse 18. Um, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also be delivered into the from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that all the whole of creation groans and labors of birth pains again together again till now. And so what that section is saying is that God subjected creation to the fall, but not willingly. In other words, he didn't make Eve eat the fruit. He didn't make the serpent talk to Eve. He did, however, allow the devil to be in the garden, which it seems from Ezekiel 28, that it was in the garden that he fell. It was actually there in the garden that his heart was found to be corrupt. And then he acted on that by bringing the woman into question God. And so God allowed the serpent in the garden with the woman so that the fall would take place. Not that he caused it, but he knew that it would because God's eternal. He knows everything, right? And God, not only did he know it was going to happen, but he also knew, this this is going to stretch your grave out a little bit, he also knew 
that he could have created any other alternative world. He knew every combination of every, if you, th- you understand what the multiverse is, the multiverse existed in God's mind. And he could see every possible combination of existence in his mind. And he chose to create this planet this way where we would fall and why. Well, I tell two stories to illustrate this, but I won't go completely into the stories. But basically, um, Adam and Eve were in the garden. They had everything they possibly could have wanted, and maybe they would have loved God. Maybe they would have followed God. Maybe they would have lived in all eternity in love with God and had children. But what about a million years later and their children's 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 children? What if they didn't love God? Then what? Oh, it was a good gig. We got fruit. We got, you know, a job. We got, you know, everything handed to us on the silver platter, but we don't love God. And they wouldn't have to. But what happened was God allowed the fall. And so now man is born on the opposite side of the tracks. And so he has to reject his nature to choose God now. You have to go against your sinful nature because you love sin and you love to commit sin and you love, you know, in your human flesh, that's what you want to do. And we have to say, no, I don't want what my flesh wants. I want what God wants for me instead. And so that makes it to where nobody will be in heaven that doesn't want to be. And that's why God created us. God created us for fellowship, not to make us robots. Because if we were just in the garden for all eternity, we'd just be robots. We'd love God because of all that he did for us. That's what the book of Job is about. When you see Job, you know, Satan says, oh, he just loves you because you've blessed him. You know, you've given him everything he wants. And God says, okay, take it away from him. Let's see what happens. And Job wouldn't curse God. Job loved God. He knew that God had a purpose for it even in the worst of the circumstances. And that's what God wanted, and that's what God produced, allowing evil and good, because you really can't have the good without the evil, can you? You know? Now, why would God do that? Why would he be so, maybe some would say, and I dare say, sadistic, that he would allow us the potential of going to hell? Let me ask you this question. Why would you have a child? Why would you have a child when there's a potential that they could end up in hell or they could end up dead or they could end up... Why do we have children? We have children because we desire the fellowship and we have the hope that they'll come to um, the right choice. And, and, And that's why we do that, not because, you know, we're hoping that, you know, I mean, that's a crapshoot, you know. It is, it's scary, you know. Why do we enter into any relationship? Why, why would we ask um, a girl out on a date or a guy out on a, you know, a guy, I hope a guy would ask us on a date or whatever people do these days. Why would we do that? Because we know that there's a p- potential of rejection. But it's the hope that's set before us that we do it. That's why Jesus died on the cross, because of the hope. And so when Jesus died on the cross, you'll notice that he balanced the scale. Adam took fruit from the tree and ate it. Jesus died on a tree. God says, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Jesus did die. And how did Jesus die? He died on a tree. And the Bible tells us in Revelation that he died from the foundation of the world. How is that possible? Because God, in his sovereignty, in his eternal sovereignty, saw what happened in the garden. And he promised that the seed of the woman would come, a a male-born child would come and undo what the serpent did. Therefore... Adam and Eve, only all they were left with was belief, to trust God that a child would be born that would undo what happened in the garden. Jesus was the promise of that child, and it it was available to everybody from Adam and Eve all the way until the end of the book of Revelation by faith. You had to trust God would send that child to save us from our sins. Jesus was the fulfillment of that child. He was also the kinsman redeemer. He was the closest relative to Adam because he was the son of God. Adam... Luke chapter 3, it says Adam was the son of God. Not the begotten son of God, but the created son of God. Just like the angels are the created son of God. But he was a human son of God, Adam was. Jesus was the only born son of God 
who was Adam's brother, closest relative, and had the right of redemption, according to Jewish law, to redeem his brother and all that he'd lost, which was the kingdom of the, of the earth, because Adam was given dominion over everything, and it was um, his life. And so Jesus was the kinsman redeemer who would set him free. Now, there's an interesting law about the kinsman redeemer. If you have a relative, a close relative who sets you free, you can choose. And so like if you went into slavery because you did something, you broke a law or you hurt somebody and in, instead of going to jail, you would become their slave is how that worked in those days. And so if you were somebody's slave, then your closest relative had the right of redemption, meaning he could buy back your land that you lost and he could buy back you. If you liked your master, you didn't have to go free. And so too, for every single person, he died not only for our sins, John 2, 2, 2 John 2, 2 John chapter 2 says, oh wait, 1 John 2, 2, sorry. 1 John 2, 2 says, and he himself is the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only ours, but also of the whole world. He died for all the sins of all mankind in the entire earth. And yet only those who receive the gift, the, the, the penalty for the kinsman redeemer, which was death. God said the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Jesus died from the foundation of the world. Anybody who would receive it, the free gift, to be set free, would become God's child. If their deeds were evil, they would reject it. They wouldn't want it, right? They loved Satan. They loved their master. They want to be a slave to sin for the rest of their life. So that's, that's a real shoddy and you know, quick overview of the redemptive plan. But it doesn't work without free will. Because if there isn't free will, then people are just robots. God is a monster sending people to hell arbitrarily and there's no point in life, right? Does it make sense? So free will is important because God wants us to choose him. He wants to be wanted, just like you want to be wanted. You know, you want people in your life to want you. You want your children to want you. You know, you want your, your mother and father to want you. And then when that's broken, it's heartbreaking. But you can't have the one without the other. You can't have the love without the potential of heartbreak. And that's why God allowed the fall. Does it make sense? Okay, um, if a person says he believes in Jesus but disobeys, is disobedient, is he saved? Well, that's not an easy question to answer because I think to a degree we're all disobedient, aren't we? And so really what happens is when we come to Jesus, we're to repent of our sin, meaning we turn towards God. Repentance is used in two different ways. One is repentance towards God and repentance from sin. In other words, I don't want to live for sin or for the devil anymore. I want to live for God. And so we're, we find ourselves in a situation. But if you look at Moses' life, you look at David's life, you look at Paul's life, you look at Peter's life, you look at all these people, um, they were disobedient at times. Um, so disobedience doesn't mean that we're not saved. It just means we're disobedient. The reality is, is that salvation is something that Jesus does on the inside. It's, as we talked about on Sunday, you know, everyone who's born of the Spirit, the wind blows where it wishes. We hear the sound of it. We don't know which way it comes or which way it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. You and I can't see somebody who's truly saved, if they're truly saved or not. They may be in complete, flagrant disobedience to, de- disobedience to the Lord and going the wrong direction like Jonah did, but God's going to grab them by the nap of the neck and he's going to yank them back, and that's going to happen in their life, and it's not going to be pretty. And they're miserable if they're, if they're truly saved and they're walking in disobedience. They may get swallowed by a fish. <laughs> they may get rebuked by a slave girl. You know, we, we think of all the stories in the Bible where people were disobedient to God, and God pulled them back. But if their life is marked with disobedience or they're being disobedient to God, um, maybe they're living in sin or something like that, we as Christians are always to assume they're not 
saved. We're not to just, oh, I know he's saved because I remember he went down. the. It may have been a false conversion. We don't know. It's not for us to judge whether they're saved or not. But we can judge the fruit. And if they're living in sin, then we're, as Christians, we're to share the gospel with them. We're to tell them to turn to Jesus. We're to pray for them. Um, you know, and some of them may be saved, but they're walking in disobedience to God, and God's going to pull them back. You know, they're going the opposite direction than God wants them to go. Um, so, as, as Christians, we need to, um, we, we should see the fruit in somebody's life. However, you could, and I've seen people like this, that they totally seem like a wonderful person. And they said they were a Christian, and they were walking a very obedient, it would seem, life, but you don't know their thoughts. And they could be wicked as the day is long, you know, in their, in their mind, and never truly converted, and thinking because they're, they're doing good things that they're saved. Um, so, it's, it's, it's the, back to the parable where Jesus says, you know, a, a man sowed wheat in his field, and the enemy came amongst them and sowed tares. And you see, you have wheat and tares growing together. And so you never truly know um, what you're dealing with all the time. But the fruit is going to make it evident. You know, if you see the love of God manifested in their life, um, and you see a, a true change, then that's a pretty good indication that that person's truly saved. If you don't, you know, you know maybe that fruit's going to come later. You know, I know that we all deal with things in our lives, and Jesus is very patient to deal with things one at a time sometimes. Some people, they come to the altar, they get saved, and God just removes alcoholism and drugs and everything from their life. Other people struggle through that. You know, and, and I think that all of us have things we struggle through. Um, that, that the Lord's talking to us about. So it's not so easy to say, oh, they're disobedient, so they're saved, or not saved, or they're obedient, so they are saved. It's, it's a foggier line than that. Um, what does raka in Matthew 5.22, what does that mean? Let's, let's turn there. Matthew. Okay, let's see here. How do I, how do I run this? Car here, okay. Oh, here we go. Matthew. Matthew five twenty-two. Okay, it reads this. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. I think the b- better, bigger question would be, what does you fool mean? <laughs> um, and so Raka, it means worthless or empty. You know, you, you know you're, you're worthless. You know, if you say you're worthless to somebody, then that's what... Strongest Concordance tells me anyway, so I cheated. But raka means worthless or empty. What Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 5 is, is the Beatitudes. And there's a psalm that's, that prophesies of the Messiah that says he will magnify the law and make it honorable. And so what we find ourselves when we read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 in that um, Sermon on the Mount Jesus is basically bringing every single person under condemnation. You know, he, he goes through and he talks about, um, you know, what our attitudes should be. And we listen to what Jesus says about our attitudes and we can't disagree with it. We're like, yes, that's exactly what everybody's attitude should be. And then we look at ourselves and we're like, oh, you know, I don't hunger and thirst after righteousness like I should. I don't, you know, and, and so especially when we're a brand new believer, we read these things and we see how miserably we fall short. He, he kind of goes through this whole chapter, and at the end of it, he says, you know what, just be perfect as my Father in Heaven is perfect. Oh, <laughs> we fail. We, we're not perfect, are we? And yet Jesus says, this is the standard. This is the standard. Perfection is the standard. And if, you do, you're, if your righteousness is stuff like, if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means... See the kingdom of heaven. He raises the bar so high that we finally will just cry out, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then putting our trust in Jesus, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, he has perfected forever, past tense, 
those whom he is sanctifying. In other words, when God looks at you, he doesn't see himself. He sees the atoning sacrifice in your place. And he, he, he is still in the process of sanctifying you. In other words, he's still making you holy. But he already sees you seated with Christ in heavenly places, it tells us in Ephesians. He already sees you as perfected because that's what he's doing in you. And so, you know, it's a process on our end. And, and it, it's a process we all should be going through. Sanctification, becoming holy, you know, letting things go in our lives that aren't right, drawing close in relationship with God. That's really what's going to do it. It's not about making a list and following rules. It's about knowing God. And when you know God, he puts his finger on things in your life that aren't his, and that changes you. So when it says, that's a long, long answer for what does Raka mean, um, because you might be afraid of being in danger of the council, or if you call somebody fool, hey, you fool, you know, you're in danger of hellfire. He's basically saying no, uh, no idle word is going to go unpunished. And so if you don't allow your punishment to fall on Jesus, then you're in big trouble, is what this is saying. And, and Jesus in our lives should change our attitude. And you'll notice, hey, I, you know, I, I notice I don't swear at people like I used to, and I notice that Jesus is starting to change my heart towards other people, you know, um, and, and softening me and making me more like him. And that should be the process. That should be what a Christian experiences as they follow Jesus, is they're being, being made more and more like him every day. Okay. Acts 19. Um, oh, okay. Acts 19. Let's turn there. Let me get my real Bible. Okay, and so the background of this, Acts 19, is Paul was, um, oh, there's more to it, because they did not know of his existence, question mark. Um, the Holy Spirit must be invited in. Must someone know the Holy Spirit to be saved? Okay. Let's talk about this. Acts 19. The, the context of this is Paul, well, before Paul went to Ephesus, there was a man by the name of Apollos. And Apollos was an eloquent man, mighty in speech, and he was in the synagogues in Ephesus, in Asia Minor, convincing the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the one to come that had been promised, that Israel had been waiting for. The problem was, is that Apollos believed in Jesus, believed he was the Messiah, but did not know, because he's from Alex, he was from Alexandria, so maybe he just had heard and believed um, at the preaching of John the Baptist. He might have been there when Jesus was baptized. He was preaching that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, but he didn't know that Jesus had died on the cross, and he didn't know that he'd risen from the dead. And so he was preaching Jesus eloquently, but didn't know those details, didn't know Jesus died on the cross, didn't know he rose from the dead. So Apollos was preaching in the synagogue, and Priscilla and Aquila, these, these two folks um, that were in Corinth with Paul, had traveled to Ephesus. Paul had gone into the synagogue one Sabbath day and then left, and then Priscilla and Aquila heard Apollos preaching about Jesus, and they pulled him aside and they explained the way of salvation more accurately to him. And so Apollos heard, believed the gospel, already believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and now he understood Jesus was the resurrected Messiah and that he was God and all that. And so then he left and went to Corinth. Remember Paul talking about Apollos being in Corinth. Paul, at that same time, came into Ephesus. And finding some disciples, people who believed in Jesus as Messiah, but did not know of the death and resurrection of Jesus, had not yet been um, fully explained. And so Paul noticed when he talked to these disciples, they're talking about Jesus and Jesus is our Messiah, and they were excited about that. But he noticed that there was something lacking in their life, just a discernment by the Holy Spirit. These disciples are missing something. And And so he asked them, to what were you baptized? And they said, we were baptized into John the Baptist. And let's just read it. It says, and it happened when Apollos was in Corinth, Paul having passed through, 
the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he noticed that they were lacking power, didn't have the Holy Spirit. They said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what were you, you then baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying people should believe on him whom would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So these disciples, Paul noticed that they were, they were lacking power, and so he asked them about their baptism. They didn't understand the full gospel. Paul explained to them, baptized them in the name of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to invite the Holy Spirit in or know the Holy Spirit to be saved in that sense. Because um, if you remember in um, Acts chapter 10, in Cornelius' house, Peter was preaching, and before they were baptized or anything, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came upon them, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. They didn't necessarily know about the Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit hit them. (laughs) Then they knew. You know, and they probably didn't even know all that was happening to them until Peter explained, this is the power of the Holy Spirit on you. Um, that was similar in my life. When I was um, 18 years old, I was in New Jersey at my Aunt Franny's house, and I was just praying and seeking the Lord, and I received a baptism of the Holy Spirit, just powerful baptism of the Holy Spirit. I had no idea what happened to me for like two years. I had no idea what had happened until somebody explained the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I was like, oh, that's what happened to me. And so I was similar to these guys, ignorant of the Holy Spirit. And yet the Holy Spirit, you know, can work in your life whether or not you believe in him or not. Um, Similar to that story I told about the guy that was driving down the road and started to speak in tongues and then called his pastor and said, you need to call the Calvary Chapel guy. He knows, he believes in that stuff. We don't. (laughs) Which is a great story. Um, Okay, so... I don't think I have any text messages. I don't see any messages on... Oh, wait, wait, there was a message. Hang on. Oh, no, there wasn't. Okay, somebody's just saying they just studied that. My, my buddy, James, who's a pastor as well, is watching. Hey, James. Um, let's see. Anybody text anything in? I don't have any text messages. Okay, anybody have any questions? Raise your hand. Claudia, did you have questions? You had questions, didn't you? Oh, all right. Questions. We have time. We have like a half an hour. Just raise your hand or text. I have no texting questions. No Facebook questions. Yeah. Okay, so what it actually says, let's, I'll read it to you. Here, let's see. It's, that's close, Joanne. <coughs> okay. There's actually two versions of it, and oh boy, that was the wrong thing to put in. I'm doing a search to try to find it here. And I'm putting Father, which was a bad thing to put in. Yeah, there's, I, I scrolled and scrolled and scrolled and didn't get out of Genesis. Okay, there we go. This should do it. Okay. Um, oh, there's got to be more. Okay. So, Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, it says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And so, basically, what Jesus is saying, and then he goes on to say, He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. (coughs) What Jesus is saying there is that we have to love him more than any other relationship in our life. If we don't, we're not worthy of him. Now, there's times, there's times in people's lives 
where they do the wrong thing. You know, maybe they're in a relationship and they just really love this girl or she really loves that guy. And they make that person into an idol in their life. And that's highly offensive to the Lord. <clears throat> so they'll find out soon enough that that wasn't a good idea. You know, it's, it, it always ends in tragedy when we try to do that. But what Jesus is saying is, <coughs> if we want to put any relationship above him, we're not worthy of him. And so that sounds super negative and maybe even self-serving on God's part. But if you think about it, what were you created for? Were you created for sex with that person or relationship with that person? No, you were created for God. That's a secondary thing. And so you have to um, realize that God is the only relationship in your life that's going to satisfy your soul. And, and when, we, when we discover that, then we, we are living for the purpose in which we were created. You know. <coughs> now, of course, none of us are worthy of him anyway, right? Um, and so we, we have to find that that relationship becomes the primary relationship in our life. And when that relationship becomes the primary relationship in our life, then everything falls into place. And um, like I, I think I shared it on Sunday, that if we don't enjoy God first, then we really can't enjoy anything in life. Everything's a burden. Even blessings are a burden. Good things, bad things, everything's a burden until we enjoy God first. And then when we enjoy God first, the trials, you know, we find joy in trials. We find blessing in, in, in even our infirmities. And we can enjoy even the good things that God's given us, our families, our possessions, you know, if he gives us a house. But then we also enjoy him first, and so if God takes our house away, takes our family away, um, or we're heartbroken, but what we're really possessing is God. I always thought it was um, an interesting thing. You know, if you want to see what life is all about, just go visit a nursing home. And you will find people there who have lost everything. They've lost their dog. They've lost their house. They've lost their friends. They've lost their husband. They've lost their kids. They've lost everything. And maybe they haven't lost their kids in the sense of their kids are just not visiting them anymore, you know, and they're just there alone. And yet you'll find people there. And I remember this one lady, my wife and I used to do a, um, a Bible study on Coffee Street in Boise at this nursing home. And there was this one lady there and she was so full of joy and she couldn't walk. <coughs> she lost her ability to walk. She lost her ability to even bathe herself. She'd lost everything. It would seem her husband, she'd lost two husbands. She'd lost, um, all of her kids her pa- had passed away and she was so full of joy. And we're, she's like, will you come down to my house? And so we walked down the hallway to her room and she just, she's like, Oh my goodness, you wouldn't believe it. The other night, the little nurse was giving me a bath and I think she's close. I was telling her about Jesus and I think she's close. And I was just like, wow, here's a woman who in a worldly sense has lost everything, but honestly has lost nothing. And it just hit me that you can lose everything in life if you live for the things of this world. But if you live for Jesus, nobody can take that away from you. And it doesn't matter what happens to you. If you end up in a nursing home in a wheelchair, lost all your privileges, and yet you have Jesus, you have everything in one, one thing. And that's, <coughs> that's, it was a beautiful thing to, to witness that firsthand in that woman's life and other ladies in that nursing home as well who knew Jesus. And we had a little church. We, you know, it was just awesome, little church service. And we saw people, I, we saw a 100-year-old man. Shannon led a 100-year-old man to the Lord. And I led several of the ladies just through the church service there, led them to the Lord. I remember asking, you know, how many of you guys know if you die today, you're going to be saved? And like none of them raised their hand. And so I explained the gospel to them, explained the work that Jesus did. And, and several of them received the Lord right then. And three, with them, three of them within the next couple of months were dead. And I mean, just talking about, you know, a twilight ministry, you know, like end of the end of the line, you know, and here you are just sharing the gospel with people who so desperately need it. And you just never even think about it, you know, because they're a lot of times forgotten. But you know, what a beautiful thing to know that you can have everything if you have Jesus. You know, he'll never leave you, forsake you. He'll never disappoint you. He's satisfaction guaranteed. So another question. Yeah, Doreen. Who are they talking about? How is he 
Hang on, it would help be helpful if I was in Second Corinthians instead of First Corinthians. <laughs> like what? I don't see that at all. Okay, so what verse are you on? Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> therefore, we have, in verse 13, it says, Therefore, we have comfort, been comforted in you, in your comfort, and we rejoice exceedingly more of the joy of Titus because his spirit, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if anything I have boasted to, to him about you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our, our boasting to Titus was found true. And his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore I rejoice, I have confidence in you and everything. So what had happened, remember Paul leaving Ephesus had, he was planning on sailing to, um, to Achaia where Corinth is, but there was a riot in Ephesus. And so Paul escaped with his life. I mean, basically they... they thought that they were they had the sentence of death in them, he would say, about leaving Corinth, uh, Ephesus. And so instead of going on ship, which would, would have been a death sentence because they would have easily found him on the ship that he was booked on, he snuck out of the city and went north to Troas. And when he went to Troas, maybe on the ship, he sent Titus in his place. And so Titus went over to Corinth delivering a letter to him. And um, he was afraid... That, well, okay, no, he wrote 1 Corinthians first, rather. And then he sent Titus later, as he was still going up through Troas, he sent Titus to see how they'd responded to that letter. And so Titus went to see, and so when Paul was in Troas, a great door was opened to them for the gospel, but <coughs> he had no peace in himself because Titus, his brother, had not returned. So Paul sailed from Troas to Macedonia, which is Philippi, north of Corinth, and Titus met him in Macedonia finally. And so he was encouraged when he found Titus, because he was stressed out that Titus didn't return when he was supposed to. He was encouraged. And then um, Titus told him that they had repented. And so Paul, you know, having sent that second letter, or that, well, no, I guess it was the first letter he sent. I don't know, whatever. I'm confused. I'm confusing myself. He sent the first letter. That's right. He sent him the first letter, and Titus, bringing that letter or checking up, up on that letter, had found that they had repented that the guy who was sleeping with his father's um, wife had repented and that all the things he wrote to them about the abuse of the gifts and um, suing one another and sexual immorality and, and divisions that they had, for the most part, the church had received that and had repented. And so he's saying, I boasted to Titus that you guys would repent and you did. And so he's more encouraged by it more encouraged by you by seeing it firsthand than just me telling him is what that means. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? We have lots of time, seriously. I mean, it's like... You guys don't have any Bible questions? Well, I kind of have a Messianic Jew question. Okay, Messianic Jew question. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know what the question is, uh, actually. I mean, I need some sort of understanding about wh what their belief in is and why uh, uh, the incessant uh, prayer and that type of thing. That does that okay. Know let's, okay, let's talk about that. So <coughs> Claudia's question is about um, Messianic Jews and um, what is that and, you know. So uh, uh, when a, um, a Jewish person who has follow, tried to follow the law and been obedient to the, the Jewish religion, the Old Testament, um, get saved, that person would be, be a Messianic Jew. And so that doesn't necessarily mean, so they just got saved. They're a Jew. Um, now, of course, the Bible says that when we're, when we're saved, we're born again, we die to who we are. So literally, they've died to being Jewish. They're no longer under the Jewish law. They're no longer under those customs. But <coughs> that doesn't necessarily mean because they became a Christian that they're going to stop being culturally Jewish. They probably still won't eat pork. They probably would feel like they were sinning if they ate pork. 
um, they probably still will keep the Sabbath day. They'd probably feel like they were sinning if, <coughs> if they worshiped on a different day than the Sabbath day. And so somebody who comes a Christian doesn't necessarily cast off their culture. You know, just like a Modaloni in Argentina becomes a Christian, he still wears a loincloth, you know, and still hunts monkey meat, you know, in the jungles. He's not going to give up his culture of being a Modaloni because Jesus transcends culture. And so when a Jew becomes a Christian, oftentimes they continue to practice a lot of the same rituals and celebrate the same holidays (coughs) that they did. And that's okay because they're biblical holidays. But hopefully that person, just like you, who um, grew up in a culture where thinking good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell, hopefully you discard those beliefs and believe I'm going to heaven because of Jesus and there's none good. You know, Jesus did it and that's why I'm going to heaven. Hopefully a Jew will recognize, even though I still celebrate Passover and I still do those things, I'm saved because Jesus died for my sins, not because I do all those things. Nor would I expect a Gentile to become a Jew. And so that's fine. And if somebody wants to live within their culture as a Christian, that's completely acceptable as long as what they're doing is not contrary to God's commands and what God would desire from us. (coughs) So for instance, if you are a stripper and that's how you make your money, then you might rethink your occupation because that culture doesn't fit into Christian morals, right? But Judaism in itself and practicing Judaism, unless you believe that you're saved through it, it doesn't violate, obviously, um, Christian morals. And so living within that culture is completely fine. However, it becomes a problem when somebody who is a Gentile all of a sudden says, well, I want to be a Messianic Jew. And then they start practicing the things that Messianic Jews are practicing. That's dangerous because really what they're thinking is, if I do this, then God will be more acceptable to God. But it's not those things that can commend us to God. It's, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that commends us to God. Not our dietary laws and um, <clears throat> our practices. Those are not the things that commend us to God. It's Jesus that commends us to God. And so those things become dangerous for a Gentile to start delving into that and start to celebrate those things and to do those things. Um, it's fun as a Christian to every once in a while do a Seder feast, or because you see Jesus in those rituals, and it's fun to do that. But when you start thinking, oh, well, I'm going to go kosher diet, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, that's dangerous territory. And that's what Paul was, was combating a lot within um, the Greek churches, because they were some of the, there were people from Jerusalem that were coming in and saying, you have to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. And you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And you have to (coughs) um, keep the commandments in that way Um, (coughs) and observe the law like the Jews observe the law. Um, And that's where it becomes a problem. Um, So, you know, it's nothing wrong with being a Messianic Jew. If that person was a Jew and they got saved, then they'd be a Messianic Jew, you know. But ultimately, in Christ, there's no Jew or Greek, male or female, bond, slave or free. We are all... Christian, you know, at that point. So, okay, next question. Yeah, MJ. What happened um, with the veil after it was torn, and what happened with the sacrificing practice, and what is that? Okay, so <clears throat> MJ is asking what happened to the veil after it was torn, and what happened to the sacrifice, sacrificial system. That's an interesting thing. So, basically, what um, we have in the Old Testament was <coughs> God's presence was in the inner part of the temple, the Jewish temple. Is that a cough drop? Sure. Um, <clears throat> God's, God's presence was in the inner part of the temple. And you were, you're not allowed, unless you were the high priest, you were not allowed to go into the holy holies of the temple where God's presence was. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where once a year the high priest would come in and, you know, stand in the presence of God and um, God's Shekinah glory. There was no light in that except for the presence of God. His glory would appear and then the high priest would offer um, incense, or not incense, some blood, the blood of a bull for himself first. And then he'd go out and then he'd offer the blood of the, the goat for the, the people's sins. And so that was the only time anybody ever went into the Holy of Holies. 
that was where the presence of God was. It was, it was um, called the presence. Now, there, were, there are historical accounts of people going into the Holy of Holies. There's a pharaoh who um, asked to go into the Holy of Holies, and the priest said, it's forbidden, and he says, I'm going in there anyway. And so the soldiers held the priests back, and they began to pray, and the pharaoh went in there, and he suffered an aneurysm and hit the floor. And they had to drag him out of there, and they pulled him out to the court of Gentiles. He recovered, but he realized you don't mess with God. You know, you don't go into the presence of God. Um, a sinner can't be in the presence of God. And so um, what happened was when Jesus, his, the veil of his, his flesh was torn, it really, in a sense, offered salvation to anybody who would believe. And, and anybody could come directly into the presence of God. It's like it says in Hebrews, we come boldly before the throne room of grace for help, grace, and mercy in time of need. It's amazing that we as individuals have the ability to come into the presence of God. And so that in that in when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple, which was 10 inches thick and three stories tall, ripped from top to bottom. It would have been so loud, it would have broke the eardrums of the, the priests who were serving in there. And so when that happened, you know, in a way you think, okay, open so that anybody could go in, which is in one sense true, but it's almost like it, it ripped so that God could come out and make himself available to every person. And so what they did was they sewed the veil back up <laughs> and they continued offering their sacrifices and offerings. And that happened. They, they continued to do that for the next 40 years almost until 70 AD when Titus... Um, Vespasian, the, uh, the son of the emperor who would later become the emperor, um, Titus would come in and destroy the city and the sanctuary. He'd completely demolish the temple. So from 70 AD until today, there has been no temple to sacrifice in. So it wasn't that they stopped sacrificing when the veil was torn. Um, they continued to sacrifice, practicing Judaism. But after the city and the, the temple was destroyed by Titus and he threw the rocks of the temple over the wall. And you can go to the Western Wall today and see the stones laying there on the ground. Um, there hasn't been any temple worship since that time. And the Jews, even today, have, have talked about and have prepared to build the third temple, which hasn't been built yet. But it will be built, we know, according to biblical prophecy. In the last days, the temple will be built. And they're ready to do it. They have the priests trained. They have everything ready to go um, to build that temple. And so... It's, it's going to happen. So, but yeah, they, they didn't, after 70 AD, they didn't continue to sacrifice. And, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so that's a problem for the Jewish people in their own belief that they're not sacrificing. You have a question, Joanne? Yeah. Do you mind if I stand? Sure. Sure. Um, I would if I could. <laughs> Okay, so Joanne said, I'm saying this for the people on Facebook, <clears throat> this camera here. Hi, people. Um, so um, Joanne said that we've been given a family business, and that is <coughs> um, God's business for us is to win the world for Christ. And, and she kind of feels like we have sat down on a job for the most part. And, and I think that's true. Um, in the Western world, for sure. Um, you know, there's a lot of places where persecution is happening. Think of China right now, where our hearts are broken for the Chinese Christians who are being persecuted again. Um, and we always, it always breaks our heart when we hear of persecution. We hear of persecution in China. We hear of persecution in, um, in um, Sudan, in Syria, and so many places in the world, in the Middle East as well. More Christians are dying for their faith today than ever before. And in those places, it's kind of amazing. You'd think that persecution would wipe out the church, but persecution is the fuel of the church. And so um, I agree with Joanne in the sense that in the Western part of the world where we live, 
um, we have lost a lot of that zeal, you know, and, and, and it, it is important for Christians, for us to share our faith with other people. It is life-giving when we do that, and it's scary, you know, we're scared, but, you know, we really don't have the reasons to be scared like the people in other countries are. You know, they're going to lose their life when they share the faith, and they still do it. You know, I, <clears throat> if you want to get stirred up, read um, Tom Doyle's latest book called um, Through the Fire. No, yeah, Through the Fire. <clears throat> he talks about this guy who goes to home, Syria, and he goes into the home of an Alawite who's been setting, setting, sending him threatening text messages that he's going to kill him. And he goes to his house and he says, why are you sending me text messages to kill me? Of course, hospitality in the Middle East is if they're in your home, then they're treated like royalty and you protect them with your life, even though you want to kill them. <clears throat> and um, he hands him a Bible and the guy reads it and gets saved. I mean, that's boldness to go into the house of the man who's threatening you and share the gospel with him, give him a Bible to read. And he reads it and gets saved. And, and that's happening. You know, it's, it's amazing. People under tremendous threat to their life are sharing the gospel and people are getting saved all over the world. Here's the thing. And I think this is, it's poignant and important what Joanne's saying because Brother Andrew went to, um, went to Poland. I think that was the first place that he went and gave this message to the Polish who were under communist rule. And this is what he said to them. He said, because you did not take the gospel to them, they are bringing their guns and their tanks and their troops to you. But he says, but what a blessing, because now you can go and give them, because they're here, you can go and give them the gospel. <laughs> and so that's just the reality. If we don't take the gospel to the world, the world is going to bring its weapons, its tanks, its guns, its stuff to us. And we see that. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me, and I'm going to preach a little bit here. It's amazing to me how wrapped up in politics the church has become over the last 40 years. We're so wrapped up in politics. And we want our guy in the White House, and we want things to change, and we want to see abortion overturned and we want to see um, <clears throat> freedoms given to Christians. And we want, basically, we want all the things that will make our lives as Christians as easy as possible. And the other side is getting more angry and more angry and more venomous. And we have a president now who's claiming to be Christian, praise the Lord if he is, but he's given a very bad name to Christians at the same time in the things that he's texting and tweeting and saying and the way he's attacking the opposite side. And so when he is out, whether in a few years or eight, you know, um, the end of the eight-year term, if he gets elected again, which he's done a lot of things, but when he's out, what's going to be the reaction of the United States? Are we going to put in the worst socialist, communist person on the other side? that is going to go just as far to the opposite extreme because of that. And then they're going to have all this ammunition to hate Christians even more. And I mean, the, the, our world is very vol volatile right now. And so I say all this just to say politics is not what we need. What this nation needs is the gospel. If, if the people all get saved, then the nation's going to change. But if we keep having these battles left and right, and fighting each other, it's not going to end pretty. I guarantee you that. It's going to be very ugly. And praise the Lord, if Trump is a Christian, and praise the Lord. What he needs to do is call for national repentance. Because historically, every time a nation's leader, it doesn't matter who he is, Nebuchadnezzar, Josiah, um, historically leaders who have called for national repentance, it always brings a revival in that land. And so we need to pray for our president that he calls for repentance. Because until he calls for repentance, we're just going to keep going down a scary path. We're heading towards some scary stuff in the future. And, and we will have um, loss of rights and loss of lives and everything else if, if the country continues to go the direction it's going. You know, um, and it bends back and forth between life and right and left. It's going to snap eventually, right? Isn't that what happens when you bend something back and forth, back and forth, back and forth? It finally breaks. So 
um, hopefully we can, uh, we can get on mission again as a church, as Joanne said, and fulfill our message. And our message is that Jesus Christ came to save souls, not I hope we get a good guy in the White House, right? It's that Jesus Christ came to save souls, and we need to go and share the gospel that Jesus died for people's sins, that they can be set free from sin when they turn and repent and turn to Jesus, then they'll be saved. And, and that's the message we need to bring to our friends and our families and everybody else. Okay? All right, let's pray. We're going to sing one last song, and then we'll be out of here. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time together, Lord, just to talk about your word, Lord, and hopefully answer questions, Lord. We just desire for you to be glorified and for you to... Um, be magnified in, in this church, in this community, in this city, in this um, state, Lord of Idaho, that is changing so rapidly uh, before our eyes, and in this world, Lord, as we just seek to share you and, and your love and your light, that people might find salvation, that they might find hope for their hopelessness and light for their, um, their souls, Lord, that they'd be saved, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would send us, Lord, as ambassadors to your kingdom, Lord, that we would not forget why we're here, but that we would know you and that we would share your message. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.